All right. Well, Bishop Flender, thank you so much for being with me here today and taking time in your busy schedule to meet with me. And um, I'm just excited to get to know you and hear about your, your journey and your story and what's, uh, what's working for you and where you're being challenged and what's uh, exciting you these days. So thanks so much. Well, thank you, Vesna. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Um, so some of these things I mentioned in an email to you at one point, and um, so some of this will be a little bit repetitive, but I figure I would just sort of do a quick background. Um, as you may know, I'm the director of the nonprofit organization ProgressiveChristianity.org, and um, we are an international organization primarily online. We offer resources for people who are building community, who are in faith communities, um, and those are a wide range of spiritual resources such as uh, sermons, articles, books, books, reviews, curriculum, study guides, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we also offer networking and community building support. So we're wanting people to feel supportive in creating or sustaining their progressive communities. And um, another thing that we're doing right now is that we are publishing the subscription newsletter called Progressing Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that grew out of the previous uh, Bishop Spong newsletter, which was a new Christianity for a new world. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a large following and he retired a couple years ago and gave us his endorsement to allow it to evolve into something a little bit new. And so we took that opportunity to <clears throat> seek, and we continue to seek um, authors and leaders and visionaries who are at the cutting edge um, mm -hmm. in the progressive theology world of Christianity. So, um, a big part of what I'm doing right now is seeking out people who we feel are leading this movement, um, either locally in their communities as examples or on a larger scale through books or speaking engagements and whatnot. And as I mentioned to you, um, we are really doing our best effort right now to center voices of women of color people of color in general, but primarily women of color. We feel that for much of the movement, it has been led by a predominantly a white male, mostly kind of like scholar, uh, historian, pastor um, type, author type person. And that has really done an effective job at helping um, Christians who are leaning into a more authentic path to um, to become informed, to deconstruct potentially what they were taught, um, and to uh, look at the Bible and the history and the teachings of Jesus from a more historical, um, scholarly uh, perspective. And that was really important, I think, for a lot of people. And it sort of left us with this vacuum of how do we reconstruct our faith then? Um, if we're inclusive, if we're looking at the Bible from a historical perspective, if we're questioning uh, the beliefs that we've been passed down, um, what, you know, where does that leave us? And if there is indeed a progressive Christian movement, what is that? What are, what are sort of the tenets? What are the beliefs? Where do we want to go? What do we want to do in this world as a group of people? So um, in some ways, this is a long history, and in other ways, we're at a precipice. We're in a transitionary moment right now of um, bringing together people from around the world to figure out how we can be a predominant force in the world of compassion um, by following the teachings of Jesus and also still be very relevant and meaningful in today's world. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about us, mm -hmm. and um, I am very interested. I came across some of your sermons, and then I went on like a Yvette Flender mm -hmm. sermon binge, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and even in one of them, uh, it was 
a very moving sermon and you were basically saying, I'm not going to quote you because it was a while ago now, but you're basically saying, look, we need prophets, you know, and we need people who are willing to push the edge, who are willing to stand up and, um, and lead. And this whole sermon, the whole time I was thinking like, you, you, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're it's great that you're calling that out. And also, I really see that in you. I admire your work. I admire your teachings very much. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm really interested in your theological journey. Um, kind of, you know, a background on your, on, on where you came from and how you grew into the role that you're in today. Um, and maybe some of those shifts when they happened and, and why. Well, I am, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you, sister. I appreciate your work. And John Shelby Spong is both a friend and a mentor. Wonderful. And I'll be able to talk a little bit about that as we go along. But um, I am uh, born and raised among uh, African-American Pentecostals mm -hmm. who, who uh, migrated from the South, primarily Texas in my family, Texas, uh, and uh, Oklahoma to the United States uh, uh, unusual r realities uh, in California. <laughs> 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 like, it's like a foreign country in the United States at the mm -hmm. time, you know. But well, that's, my, that's what my folks did just prior to World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, I was raised in the womb of the Church of God in Christ, uh, which of course is a Trinitarian Pentecostal group that was founded by Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. And it came out of the uh, Azusa Street movement under William Joseph Seymour in Southern California. Um, I was raised in a reasonably closed society, closed um, fundamentalist society and, and organization and a church and denomination. And my grandfather was a bishop uh, connected to Bishop Mason in the early, early years. I have two other Kojic bishops in my family, mm -hmm. uh, both of which, of course, are men. And uh, I had a very good, wonderful childhood. And, you know, I was uh, safe in the womb of the church. You know, everything we did, our recreation and interaction and, and all our eating and everything, we did among ourselves and I felt very safe. I went back and forth to the houses of the different saints as we called each other. Um, was raised with their children, uh, tolerated school. <laughs> Church was so much more important than anything else, you know. Um, and matriculated through the denomination and through the church and sort of was uh, destined, I was in a highborn family. So I was destined to be a Kojic leader um, mm -hmm. among women. Hmm. which is, of course, very different than the leaders among men. Uh, I, I would suggest that I had three distinct departures that made me leave that experience. One was uh, that I sensed myself to be called to social justice work. And our eschatology did not really embrace the idea of echo justice or uh, fighting back or pushing back against racism or certainly not pushing back against patriarchy and sexism. Um, basically what we were, were focused on is enjoying ourselves with each other and essentially our wonderful worship services and our singing and our such the like. But our eschatology had us always focused on the soon coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was really coming like on Friday or something <laughs> like that. So there was very little time and energy put into repairing the planet, hmm. being in, engaged in the body, body politic, or in, the, in the political systems. Uh, all of this was in the hands of Jesus. And, you know, it's, it's a, sort of a oxymoron to try to heal the earth when you're so sure that Jesus is going to come blow it up at any <laughs> given time. So yeah. our focus was on trying to get right with God and stay right with God because you could sin uh and and you would be damned to hell so you had to to keep coming back trying to get it right so it was a it was a huge uh, part of our time and effort 
was trying to get ourselves right with God and get everybody that we met right with God because of this imminent and punitive return um, mm -hmm. of Christ. And so that was the way I was raised. And yeah. I, depart, I departed from it because I had a real problem with the call or reconciling the call to social justice to that kind of eschatology, the apocalyptic eschatology. I couldn't connect it. Why would I care about people? But I did deeply care right. about seniors, about uh, children. I had a foster, foster group home for uh, hard to place young people, got engaged in the HIV epidemic, worked very, very hard to save people's lives. And the two things just did not jive. So that was my first departure. I would say my second departure would be that I sensed myself fully capable of doing this work as a woman. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we had to, to speak from another podium. We couldn't go to the, we couldn't mount the pulpit. We couldn't go up the stairs <laughs> into the pool, except the cleaning lady. <laughs> <laughs> she got a pass for some reason, but the rest of us oh. women, we could not, we had to talk from the floor, never from the, uh, couldn't ascend right. up, up into the pulpit. Um, we were in this constant place of having to always affirm our men. Mm -hmm. We had to keep talking about how wonderful they were and how we thank God for them, even if we were writing their sermons. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know, yeah. Our job was to make them feel secure always because they seemed that their the patriarchy was very fragile right and it seemed that there was always some way you could cross that line and then you would just screw up the whole rest of your life is yeah. the way and so i couldn't figure that out and i remember one of my relatives that had been incarcerated uh, was a minister and he got out of jail and um one of my uncles uh, wanted to appoint him again to be over the youth department which the whole time he was in jail I was responsible for the youth department. Mm -hmm. And I asked my uncle, I said, so tell me, how is it that he's going to be over the youth department as the youth pastor? What, what does that make me? Mm -hmm. He said, well, you just keep doing what you're doing and keep helping him, but we can't make you the pastor. So I said, let me get this clear. I keep doing the job. <laughs> he gets the, the, the call and the title right. while I'm doing the job. So, well, you know, he said, it's, it, everything is not in a name. Everything is not in a title. I said, okay, well then, why don't we call you a usher? <laughs> right. Why are you the pastor of the church? How would that make you feel? Yeah. How would you feel about that? So needless to say, shortly after that, I had to find somewhere else to go. Yeah. I was in trouble on several levels, you know, yeah. internally, externally, the whole deal. Around, I, uh, around when, like it, what year around the- well, I was year? young. I was um, in my, probably in my middle 20s. Mm -hmm. so I was young. Um, and I also, I, I, it would be important to lift up what, what is really the third departure. Some people think it's the initial departure, but it's not. The other two came first. Right. The third was when I sensed myself to be a same gender loving woman. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's a significant underground of same gender loving people in, in every fundamentalist denomination that I know of, yeah. um, in basically every religion that I've ever been connected to, I have always known that there were same gender loving people and trans people and people who walk the line in terms of gender identity and so forth. Um, so I wasn't alone. I didn't, you know, I didn't learn sex outside of the church. I learned sex inside of the church. I right. never had to leave church. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> the reason I had to leave uh, when I left was because I could not conscience lying about who I was yep. and who I am. I just couldn't pull it off. Yeah. It didn't make sense to me uh, that God would call me and not be aware of who I am. Mm -hmm. The same God that called me knew it was me <laughs> when God called me, right? right. Right. particularly to, to be engaged in ministry and injustice work. And so I couldn't reconcile that. I decided if I was going to err, I was going to err on the side of authenticity. And I would not try to serve God in subterfuge. That, that wouldn't work for me. So I began to get involved in justice work. I left church altogether. 
and uh, justice work be, was my worship. Mm -hmm. uh, working with seniors, working with young adults, working with people living with HIV, helping people to get off substances and mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of things like that. Felt very good about it until I had an epiphany driving down the street in my car when um, I felt in my Pentecostal self mm -hmm. what was in fact and indeed the voice of God speaking to me such that I had to pull over to the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And I had that moment, you know, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal who experiences the presence of God. I speak in tongues, I pray in tongues, I sing in tongues. I, I was raised that way. Yeah. And it's real, it's the real manifestation. I've come to believe that God does honor your expectations mm -hmm. and your experience um, in terms of how you are, how you, are uh, how you express the divine. Absolutely. in your personal and private prayer life. So spirit knew what to do with me. Overshadowed me in my car. I had to pull over to the side of the road. And I heard what, what was almost an audible voice say to me that it was time for me to get re-engaged in the ministry of the church or in the church. And I argued, that's how much I, I heard the voice. I said, oh no, I'm not doing that. I'm done with that. I'm out here doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Yeah. You get somebody else. I'm good. I've been there, done that, you know, yeah. uh, but the call was very clear. And that's what began my journey back to, back to ministry full time, back to engaging the text, back to um, trying to repair the breaches, both inside myself and with many of the others that I came in contact with. So those are the broad things. I'm sure we'll talk with more specificity, but those are some of the, the things that really moved me mm -hmm. to evolve to the person that I am today. Well, I honor your bravery because coming from where you came from, um, it took a lot of courage to, to step into that authentic path and to be willing to ask those questions. And it sounds like to still hold very dearly your own faith and your own mm -hmm. personal relationship. So that's, that's a hard line, I think, to walk. I think many people just leave, you know, and then they have spiritual wounding because they're left with nothing else, you know, but that doesn't work, so then it's nothing. So um, do you remember what, when you had to pull over in the car, what, what the message was exactly? or? Was it just that it was clear to you that you were being called into ministry? Well, called back into ministry. That was the thing. It was a, it was a sort of a supernatural U-turn, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. But I was different, mm -hmm. you know? Um, when I left, you know, I left for the, the reasons that I lifted up to you. Mm -hmm. But when I made the U-turn and I came back, it was clear that there was a synergy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't justice or Jesus, it was justice and Jesus. Right. And then it moved to what I call justice for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, justice or Jesus suggested that it, you could be so heavenly minded that you know earthly good, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, justice and Jesus suggested that both of these concomitant streams that were running through me needed to merge. And I needed to see Jesus in justice. Mm -hmm. and justice in Jesus. But mm -hmm. then I moved forward to a justice for Jesus, which meant that I needed to understand the beauty and the power of Jesus' humanity. Right. I remember the aha moment when I realized Jesus never wrote anything. Yeah. Nothing. Everything that we know basically was written about him. Exactly. You never hear that he wrote anything. He might have been functionally illiterate. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but one thing I do know is that we don't have anything that we believe that Jesus wrote. Right. So I think that that is part and parcel to why we have always had perceptions, just like the Bible writers did. I think they interpreted Jesus through their own hermeneutic, through their own lenses. Uh, I, I find it amazing that Jesus was never given or permitted some very clear, passionate relationships, human right. relationships. Right. He Jesus. was very much a human man, teacher, you know. You know and, and what human 
what human man do you know that has never experienced eros? Right. You know, there are very few that have, were not given passion in a personal relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. What happened to Jesus? I think about it sometimes. I said, poor <laughs> Jesus. And I remember, I remember thinking once to myself, I was praying, uh, especially when I was younger. It's like, Jesus, I need you to help me with this, you know, this um, out of control libido stuff that happens <laughs> at one time in life. And then it dawned on me. I said, why am I asking you? <laughs> Allegedly, this never happened to you. So what do you know about it, right? I have a pretty good feeling it did. <laughs> I mean, you know, but you had to come to that because yep. for the most part, it was anathema to even suggest and, and to say that Jesus is very human and not liberate Jesus to be passionate and intimately and erotically passionate, to have eros, to, to take that from him. There's so many things to take it from those that follow him unless there's, it's done in some sideways, backwards kind of way. Right. And the church has never been good around eros. No. Just, we, we just don't have grown folks conversations about this kind of stuff, you know? No, we so, don't. I, I wanted to, to not only liberate myself from the, the justice of Jesus, justice and Jesus, but justice for Jesus began to be a passion for me. Mm -hmm. Who was this brown-skinned Palestinian Jew? Yes. And what was he really up against? Because he, like so many other freedom fighters, was killed by a coalition of religion and empire. Absolutely. And I've seen it happen again and again and again. And so that made me sort of move myself toward something different from my cultural Pentecostal self. Keeping the culture, I still clap on the two and the four. <laughs> I still enjoy a Brandon, three yeah. organ. Oh, yes. I still enjoy a tambourine and a full drum set. Yeah. But, but theologically, mm -hmm. I am an evolving Christian and I am a disciple of Jesus. There's mm -hmm. no question of that. And I have had to bring those two things together internally in harmony with one another. Right. So on that note, as you're starting to reform the life of Jesus and the person, the human Jesus in your mind, um, did you have a, sort of an internal battle with, um, you know, because there's a pretty serious belief that Jesus was God. Mm-hmm. And so did that start to shift your relationship with God, with Jesus, with Christianity? Was that, a, was that a struggle or did it just sort of fall away and felt very easy and natural to you? Well, I had some, I had some in real questions. You know, you know the Bible is, is a, 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 a tricky amalgamation and, and pulling together of different things that really conflict with one another in interesting ways you know what i mean by that right so it depends on your hermeneutic you know what i mean and my when my hermeneutic was one thing i could see those things yeah that came with that hermeneutic when my hermeneutic shifted i go back to the same places and i see something else completely different right so when, when my hermeneutic began to really want to liberate jesus i began to hear him say things like um um i and god uh, are one and at the same time say things like um, that I have done great things essentially but greater things will you do mm -hmm. or you're you know we, we you're the firstborn or I'm the firstborn of many brethren or many siblings mm -hmm. or there are things that that essentially happened in his life and his experience there were more things to come that would be even greater than what his life and experience and and then the whole concept of his, his anguished prayer to god mm -hmm. and then his prayer to god that says let them be one mm -hmm. with you and i the way we are one we want them to be one it made a universal opportunity yeah for people to walk in the same steps that jesus walked in mm -hmm. and to do not only work like jesus did but perhaps greater work and but my hermeneutic permitted that right and I began to see was well, something that Paul said in his writing he said that the mystery of the ages are revealed the Christ in you is the hope of glory 
-hmm. That was a good day for Paul. <laughs> he, he, didn't have, he didn't have good days all the time. There were times that he wanted to beat up his flesh and stuff, and I felt like I wanted to take him into counseling and try to help him. <laughs> you, can't spend, <laughs> you, you can't spend your life hating yourself, son. That's what I wanted to tell him so bad. You got, you, you got to get past that. Whatever it is that took you there, we got to get you some help to go with yeah. that. But yeah. there are other times that he would say things, and I, would, I agree with him wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Christ in us as versus the Christ on us and the Christ around us and the Christ, you know, it's the Christ in us. It is recognizing and finding the God life in us mm -hmm. that gives us intimate relationship with our understanding of the divine. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Jesus came to that. He had to have because if he was very human, he had to evolve. <laughs> Yeah. And you can't be God and evolve at the same time. How do you pull that off? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he was doing the, the real work. I mean, he was. There you go. And he got really mad. Yeah. You know, and, and if we we're to read it right, he got really pissed sometimes. Yeah. And then he was also into taking care of his own people as a priority. Yeah. You know, and one of the other things I push back against is Paul's whole concept of my being grafted in, you know, that I'm a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus' own tribe, his own people, didn't receive him. And so since they didn't, then he opened up to the rest of them. I said, nope, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. But if I had been Jewish, a Palestinian Jewish, and I had written the book, mm -hmm. I probably would have preferred my people over everybody else too. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm... <laughs> Yeah. But I find that concept of exceptionalism problematic, right. though it is all over the text so that God has tribal, a people. Yeah, it was a very tribal, tribalistic very. time. Very. And all you have to do if you're a white supremacist is just take, the, take that group of people and set them aside and put yourself in their place. Yeah. Then you can, you can justify uh, a sense of superiority because the Bible is written that way. Right. right. It is written that way to suggest that one people are greater or more special to God mm -hmm. than, than all the rest of the people on earth. Everybody else is a contingency plan. It's an afterthought, you know, which is very frustrating. So many of the stories in the Bible are written to, to uh, place somebody as a leader or place some person in a lineage or, you know, it's, it's not all um, just perfect <laughs> teaching that's right. and, <laughs> and that's relevant. human beings. That's what we do. You know, yeah. I would, you, you, you would tell the story of your lineage a certain way. Mm -hmm. I would tell the story of my lineage a certain way. Right. Be because we love our people. So I'm clear that it's just that to take that and make that, the foundation upon which we build relationship with the divine is problematic. And it's another one of those cultural realities that show up in the text, you know. So, uh, you know, that my, my shift is in process. Right. You know, I have, I have lived long enough to get in touch with the fact that I'm, I'm part Native American, I'm part Irish, Ooh. I'm part African. Wow. And all of those things that are going on inside of me have had experiences with the understanding of the divine. Mm -hmm. And mine, you know, among Pentecostals and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of, of uh, ascending in, in, a, in a spiritual way are not substantively different than what happens in the sweat lodge when my other ancestors prayed for an, a revelation of it. Mm -hmm. uh, an animal spirit um, or a spirit animal or when the Muslims whirl and they're twir whirling dervishes yeah. until they feel the presence of their, the understanding of their presence of God. It's that combination of spirit and culture mm -hmm. that beautifully shows up from one group of people to another. And if we'll drop the silos yep. that make us feel exceptional because right. our experience is different, we can find the sameness in one another. Absolutely. I 
clearly see a golden thread through the, especially the mystical sides of, you know, the religious. There's, there's the religion that all were awoken through a mystical experience, yeah. and, you know, and then they became institutionalized. Yes. But that mystical experience, that, that awareness of oneness, the, the, the interconnection with the divine and, you know, this planet, um, that is threaded through all, all of our various religions and paths. Yes, hallelujah. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because <laughs> it is really the way, and I want all my stuff, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, when I, so wherever I go, I keep one thing in the back of my mind. It says, never for the sake of, of it's, it's essentially um, acceptance or affirmation, never deny the authenticity of your own lived experience. Mm -hmm. Never do that. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's important to never deny the authenticity of other people's own lived experience. Absolutely. Yeah. We can never know, you know, yeah. what someone has gone through. And I personally, and I mean, I know for sure as an organization, we believe that not, none is more authentic or valid than any yeah. other. That's right. And it's all, you know, for me, it's, it's, we're, we're pointing toward the moon, you know, and we can spend a lot of time looking at the hands pointing, or we can turn toward the moon. Um, I hear that. <laughs> so what i i'm i'm very impressed with all the work you're doing locally and in your church can you take a few minutes to just share um i know you've grown from a small community and then you were um, accepted into the united church of christ denomination um currently like what's working for you as a community what's what's helping you thrive and grow and diversify if if those are true um and, and maybe where do you see the challenges still lie? As, as far as in general, you know, church communities out there seem to be really struggling right now, mm -hmm. a, a large number of them. Mm -hmm. um, they want younger people, they want families, they say they want to diversify, they say they want to be inclusive. They're not always showing up in that way, however. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they're, they're aging and they're, they're getting smaller. Um, and so when I find communities like yours um, that seem to be just fully alive and engaged and active, um, I get really excited and I want to learn, you know, and what's, what's, that, what's that journey been like for you guys? How is, what's working and what's, where, do you, where do you still find your challenges there? Well, let me say, is I'm coming just up upon uh, 30 years of pastoring this church. Wow. Uh, 27 and <laughs> some change. <laughs> 20 I'm 28. That's where we are now. We'll be 28 in November of this year. That's amazing. And uh, I feel great. And I love the work. Uh, I am, you know, having the conversations about succession. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm one of those people that don't want to fall over dead in my own pulpit. <laughs> but also <laughs> because I... You're still on high. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I want to, you know, be able to examine, to your point, what we have learned and how, what we can download. Right. And then upload from the generations that are coming after me, you know. And, and I have moved from a couple of things I'd like to say. I think that, that, uh, that church, I'll, I'll use the term church because that's, you know, what, it, what we do is called yes. church. Um, I don't think church was ever supposed to be uh, theater style. Right. <laughs> I don't think it was supposed to be choreographed. <laughs> you know, uh, down to the, the fine science. Uh, I don't think that was ever the intent of the heart of God that we ever do that. Yeah. I think it was supposed to be more, um, less ceremonial and more familial. Yes. And so um, what I have tried to design and have had to design because I have been, I'm pulled away from my own church, my local church, mm -hmm. often for mm -hmm. a senior pastor and a senior leader um, uh, to to the offspring of this church, which would be the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, where we have congregations uh, all over the United States. And then of course, in East Africa and in South Africa and several parts of Asia, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And these congregations, it, it, they require that I come through there sometime, at least mm -hmm. regionally, mm -hmm. um, and that we touch each other. Mm -hmm. So I had to, to come, come up with, and, and and necessity sort of created this reality, what I call as versus a pyramid style church. Yeah. 
where the church is at the top and then after that, well, the pastoral leadership's at the top and then perhaps the diaconate or councils and yeah. then auxiliary leaders and department heads and then down here is community. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what we, what we have is a wagon wheel. If you imagine a wagon wheel with spokes, with a hub in the middle and spokes that go up. And each of those spokes is in some way attached to the hub, which perhaps represents some leadership from all of the spokes and held together by the community, which I see as the rim. So if the rim is what holds it together, mm. the spokes are these individual kinds of, of ministry pieces. Mm. Then there's a hub that, that is the decision-making. Mm -hmm. And when I say decision-making, I'm thinking in terms of some representative, again, from all of these groups. So to be even more specific, um, I don't take a full salary as a pastor. Mm -hmm. I take a, I have a stipend. Let's say a, 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 a certain amount of money or certain expenses that are paid for in my regard. And each of the associate pastors mm -hmm. are all also uh, working. All of them are degreed, but mm -hmm. they're all working in the fields that they are degreed to work in. Mm -hmm. Uh, social work, counseling, um, substance abuse intervention, education, something. Uh, and then so they have also some spoke <laughs> yeah. on this wheel mm -hmm. where they provide services that are their contribution to the community in mm -hmm. some real way. So what it means is that the pressure of the senior leader mm -hmm. is not anything like it is in many of our parishes. Yeah. That senior leader has some tasks that are unique to their role, um, but that's just one spoke. <laughs> yeah. And all the spokes are equally equidistant, so equally important. Yeah. Some of them have to do, for instance, with feeding people. There's a group of folks and leaders that do that. Some of them have to do with housing. Mm -hmm. There are a group of folks that do that. Some of them have to do, again, with counseling. Mm -hmm. Some of them have to do with worship design and implementation. Mm -hmm. um, and each thing is important, but it doesn't wear out one person or two people. And it means that we can also interact in community because we have tasks outside of the church. Mm -hmm. And since we're not full time in the church, we have opportunity to do things outside of the church. Mm -hmm. That creates a linkage between the ministry and the community. Mm -hmm. And I'll the larger ask. community, probably, yes. like the larger town and community that yes. you're in. Mm -hmm. My mayor said to me once, you know, you're my pastor. <laughs> and I didn't say back to him, but you never come to church. <laughs> right. Because oh. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, absolutely. It, it has to do with the, the way we interact and the authenticity of that without my making any effort. I don't even invite him to church. Mm -hmm. He's come. You know, he would come when I was in San Francisco. But I didn't, and the folks that come to our food program come by the hundreds. Wow. But we never even pass out a, a card that welcomes them to worship. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't give them a pamphlet. We don't wear t-shirts that have yeah. the church name and logo. They ask us, I, I, I heard it's a church here. And we'll say, yeah, well, we do have a worshiping community. Well, when do you worship? Well, then we'll tell them. Yeah. But we don't tell them unless they ask because we never want them to think in any way that we're feeding them because right. we're trying to get them to join us. Right, right. We, worship has begun and ended. When we put, put that food out, package that food up, or give them the wherewithal to choose whatever they want to eat, and they walk away, it's the benediction. When they take their food and they walk away, <laughs> <laughs> and we have enough. worshiped God in yeah. giving care have God's people and community so, yes so that's a different style uh, to me I think it is very different from what the way I was raised mm -hmm. and it does not su suggest success is determined by the number of people who are in the seats Absolutely. on Sunday yep that's one of the things we do yep but if you ask us at the end of the week, we have a clinic, we have a pharmacy. When ask us at the end of the week, how many people did we serve? Mm -hmm. That's a very different number. And I see it as church unusual as versus church as usual. 
Mm -hmm. So how do I imagine the future of the church? Yeah. Uh, um, a familial sacred community, mm -hmm. secure, inclusive, mm -hmm. less siloed, mm -hmm. you know, welcoming, also raggedy. That's my word. Yeah. I think church should be raggedy. Yeah. Real. Yeah, real. <laughs> I, I, I recently went to a church. Uh, my partner and I are church hop, you know, church shopping. Yes. I got it. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> hopping, church shopping. Um, and, you know, beautiful building, beautiful people. And, and yet, as you said, it was, it was, it was so choreographed. Mm -hmm. And it was so, like, I was almost in a dream because it was so the same as every mm -hmm. other type of mm -hmm. service in this type of church. Um, and... Uh, we went to another church where people had their shoes off and, and there was time for people to just sort of talk and share what was happening. And it felt like family. It felt like friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of them were serving different communities. And so there was a reason why the people that were there were there. Um, but for me, a real community is that realness. It's, it's the ability to come in with bare feet if wanted. It's the ability share that really uncomfortable thing that's happening. Um, and for the, the people to share the, um, like you said, the responsibilities, the teaching, the whole, the whole thing. So I'm, I'm happy. I, let that. me add one other thing. In, in yeah. that raggedy environment, as we call it, you mm -hmm. know, we have children that are on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and they and they have moments. Mm -hmm. And so we have had sessions. We had, we've dedicated whole Sundays to talking about autism. Yeah. So that we as a community, it doesn't stop our choreographed service because it's not choreographed. Yeah. If one of the children has an outburst, we know as a community what to do. Mm -hmm. We have other people who have service animals. And they bring their dogs and sometimes the dogs don't get along. So they have this moment. <laughs> <laughs> we had one of those last Sunday where a couple of the dogs, little bitty little dogs too, these two little bitty little dogs. They can really turn into something, these little bitty dogs. So they get into it, the little bitty dogs with each other. And then we have to, you know, manage it. Yeah. You know, we've got to stop a minute. Then we have to kind of work with the, the situation. And we got to pick up where we left off. Yeah. We keep going. And when, when you have real moments like that, mm -hmm. you know, as I said to a church once when I went to minister, this is the most perfect place I've ever seen. I said, you all, even your flower arrangements match each other. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Oh, opposite sides of the pulpit. I said, this is amazing. Yeah. They, had, they had light color fabric pews. Uh -huh. Light color. I mean, can you, you know, light color fabric pews. That's really something. Wow. You know, I said, so I'm just curious. When I was talking to him, I said, so where would your homeless people sit? Yeah. Yeah. Because essentially your building is preaching before you do. Absolutely. About who can come and who can't come. Mm -hmm. It's not like that if you go, as I would say in my community, if you go to your mama house, <laughs> if you go to your mama house, yeah. and your mama knows that you have one of your children is real different, then your mama knows that. Right. Your mama is gonna make provision for that child. Right. And, and, and it starts with the most troubled child, from the most troubled child, right? Because mm -hmm. your mama knows. Mm -hmm. That's why I see God, it's sort of like that. Right. I'm writing a book about it now. Call, call oh, my mama, I can't wait. Call my mama's <laughs> kitchen. Yeah. A theology wow. and a homiletic of radical inclusion. Yes. What, what does that look like? You know, what, is, what does it look like when the house of prayer is like mama's house? That's, that's the difference in it. So. Our, our beliefs should, should inform our actions. And if our actions do not match, then the beliefs are empty, in my opinion. There you go. So we have just 10 more minutes or okay. so. Um, one of the things that's a little bit of a tough topic for 10 minutes, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, is it possible, do you, might, do you think, that Christianity can make reparations for the racism and sexism that's been inherent in our societies. And um, if so, you know, where do we start? I think that Christianity in the fundamental teachings of Jesus, 
um, and what is attributed to Jesus. I think that Christianity can make reparations, but the, it's the beginning point that's complicated. Yeah. And the beginning point is repentance, truth telling. Mm -hmm. It has to start with, with telling the truth about what really happened. Yes. That's got us in this place of, of racism and exceptionalism and anti-immigrants and uh, the subjugation of women. There's so much I could say because mm -hmm. all of it has some scripture to back it up, let the folks yeah. tell it. So we have to begin with repentance and repentance is very, very hard mm -hmm. because what is built into repentance is an acknowledgement and a turning away. Mm -hmm. And Christianity is among the most bloody religions in the world. Yep. And certainly, it's a conquering religion it over is. and over again. So we've got to go back to the beginning of that kind of, of reality for Christianity. And we have to repent. Mm -hmm. Even those of us who were colonized by Christianity, who carried on those realities mm -hmm. into our own communities mm -hmm. and benefit from them, mm -hmm. we've got to repent. Mm -hmm. So this is not just about the, the Christian folks that did this historically. It's about the Christian folks who have now embraced it right. and pulled it into our lives. Mm -hmm. And then out of that place, still abused. When the abused become abusers. And worshiped a white male God. There you go. And, and to, to huge loss of everything else that we have in our bloodlines, you know, yeah. That's self-hatred. That's the difference in good hair and bad hair, as I say all the time. <laughs> they used to tell me that unless my hair looked like yours, I have bad hair. And so we did everything we could to make our hair look like your hair. Because mm -hmm. we had bad hair. Why was our hair bad? It was our hair. Yeah. And when we started wearing our hair the way it grows out of our scalp, yeah. the greatest enemy to that were other people who look like me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm colonized by it on the inside, which is the same thing as what happened with Christianity. We have to repent mm -hmm. and acknowledge the wrong done. Mm -hmm. And then we can, it's not just about buying somebody a sandwich. It's not just about, you know, getting the poor person some clothes. It's got to be a, a real systemic change that begins with repentance. That is the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Did you have a moment um, in your own theological, spiritual journey where you did realize that uh, predominantly as a Christian, we worship a, a white male God. Yes. Did you have those, did, did, what happened when, did you know what? That it, change? Did it just? It happened in the mirror, the truth be told. Yeah. Um, one day standing in the mirror, I, I made a decision, sister. I made a real decision. And the decision was that I am going to deeply love myself. Because I believe myself to be a uh, manifestation of the divine on earth. Yes. And I believe that, had to believe that first for myself before I could believe it for you mm -hmm. or for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that everything that God made is good. That means I'm altogether loved. Complicated, but I am God's handiwork. Mm -hmm. And I accepted that. Now, that was one of the hardest things. Authentic affirmation, self-affirmation, is a really hard thing to do. It is. When you were taught that you're substandard, or as a woman, when I was taught that I'm not, not only substandard, but I was designed by God to suffer. Yeah. And that I will only realize freedom from that suffering in eternal life. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen in this life. Mm -hmm. It was a hard thing for me to push back and tell Paul, I love you, baby, but I don't agree with that stuff. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah, you were wrong. <laughs> I did. Yeah, you, on that one, you needed, you needed a counselor. You really, <laughs> uh, Cause I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna hate my flesh. It, I'm 64 years old and it has taken me all of my adult life almost yeah. to finally fully embrace my own divinity. 
Beautiful. And I'm not gonna re I'm not gonna release that. I'm not gonna let that go for anybody, living or dead. Mm -hmm. It took that long to really embrace it. So when you do have self love, it is out of that place that you can love other people. Yeah. I don't think we can genuinely do it, really genuinely do it, unless we can love the person in the mirror. Mm -hmm. That is my truth. That is my divine truth. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything else uh, that you're feeling called to share with us before we go? I, w I would say this, and finally this, it's important to humanize Jesus. We got to do it because then we'll understand the divinity in ourselves. Absolutely. Don't degrade Jesus to humanize Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that we need to drop the silos. Mm -hmm. And there's like a whole bunch of silos in the field, the whole big field and a bunch of silos. If we drop them, I'd like to start a movement called Why Choose? <laughs> <laughs> we can go from place to place and denomination to denomination and faith to faith and still find the the essence of the divine. Mm -hmm. And I would like to suggest that we work for more to bring the kingdom of God to earth mm. than to try to get from earth to heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth mm -hmm. as it is in heaven. That, I believe, is the thing that Jesus taught us to pray. Absolutely. And I believe we should pray and live that. Mm -hmm. And here we are with all of these incredible resources to actually be able to manifest that. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. We have that ability here. So, yes. Yeah, we're proving that, that right now, me and you. Okay. I hear that call. I'm there with you. <laughs> yes, indeed. I love you, sister. Awesome. I love you too. Thank yes. you so much for your time. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Yeah, same here. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.